Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Acts. We're getting very near the end of the book. I hope we can finish this session on miracles and money tonight. We might not quite make it, might have one more week, but we need to add the two things that we have not yet talked about, two things about how God does provide money versus all the fake stuff that is going on with the charismatics. <clears throat> We're in Acts chapter 28, looking at verses 6 through 10. Miracles and Money, Part 5. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word tonight, that you will encourage our hearts, that you will help us to understand the way that you do provide for those who are your children, and that, Father, we do not have to resort to all the charlatan antics that are going on in the charismatic movement, especially today along with a lot of apostasy and false doctrine and a lot of wickedness. So, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, tonight, we're talking about Miracles and Money, Part 5. And remember the basic premise to what was supposed to be a five-part study, but may, because we didn't quite, quite far enough last week, may turn into a six-part study. But remember the basic premise, which is the key to riches is this. It's not what you own, but how you view what you own. And that's one of the things that has undergirded all the different passages that we have been looking at, all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. A rich man can be content and not covetous, but a poor man can be totally discontent and deadly covetous. God doesn't condemn you for having riches because God gave them to you. It's he who gives us the power to get wealth or to withhold it, but he does what he does with our money for two reasons. You have a lot, God had a reason for it. You have only a little bit, God had a reason for it. And what are the two reasons that the Bible gives to us? Does anybody remember? The two reasons the Bible gives to us why God either gives us money or withholds money. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, you should have remembered that because I gave that to you last week. That was something new last week. Deuteronomy chapter 8. There were two reasons that God either gives us money or withholds money from us. What are the two reasons? Okay, number one, if you didn't take it in your notes last week, number one reason is to prove us. That is, to test where our heart lies. He gives us money or withholds money to test us. Where does our heart lie? Because, you know, the poor man can love money just as much as a rich man. And God is testing us as to whether or not we love money or love God. And he knows where our heart is, so he knows whether or not to give us money to test us or to withhold money from us to test us. The second reason that God either gives us money or withholds money from us is to do us good at the end if we respond properly to the test of money. Now, doing us good may not necessarily mean giving us money, but he is guaranteed to do us good if we pass that test. We saw that after, after Moses gave the second restatement of the law, the first restatement of the law is Exodus chapter 20, where you have the Ten Commandments, but it's stated again for us in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So after that restatement, the second restatement of the law in Deuteronomy 5, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses wrote, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments, that's verse 11 where I started, and his statutes which I commanded thee this day. So the big deal is, are you going to remember what I taught you? And there's some things that stand in the way of remembering what he taught us. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, 
And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, suddenly there are things that can take our attention away, aren't there? Remember what I taught you, says God, because there's coming a day when things are going to get really nice. Where will your focus be? Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and all the things he did for you. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness, where were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee. They went through a time of deprivation. And what was it? To humble and prove them, to test them. It's the first reason God either gives or withholds money, to test us. And then it says, to do thee good in thy latter end. Second reason, to do thee good in thy latter end, if you pass the test. Because he goes on and says, and thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and my, the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. It's a test. It's a test. How are we going to deal with what God gave to us? And of course we saw the context which was about false gods down in verses 19 and 20, and that's what we were talking about this morning. The love of money is one of the false gods of our time. And you see that here in the next verse, in verse 19, it shall be, if thou do, the very next verse after, is God that gives thee the power to get wealth. It shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. That's why it's so serious about having any other gods before God. And the one we're focused on, of course, in the morning worship is the issue of music. Having our music as a false god that we call worshiping God, but it's actually worshiping Baal. It's the wrong kind of music. Very important principles. Now, you know, folks, I had several come, come up to me this morning, well, I don't know anything about music. And one guy actually uh, very strongly opposed me and said, but I don't like classical music. I said, I'm not preaching classical music. What I'm preaching are biblical principles so that you can discern spiritually whether or not the music you're listening to fits the categories. Now we're going to be talking about the New Testament gives us three specific categories for music. I haven't talked about those yet, but three specific categories. And you've got to be able to fit your music into one of those three categories. Otherwise, it is not right. But I'm not going to preach the morning message, which is for next week. But we're back to here. But this is something that's very big with God, the issue of false gods. And we make all kinds of false gods. And the one we're talking about in the evening service is the issue of money. Because that's what has been, you know, so prominent in modern charismatic theology and a lot of neo-evangelical theology, the health and wealth and prosperity gospel, so-called, that we have to face today. And they take those verses that we just read out of Acts chapter 28 and say, well, you see, uh, here is the way you get money. Look at Paul doing miracles and getting money for it. We're so doing miracles now, and we're going to be getting money for it. We haven't lost our train of thought, but all of these things tie together under the category of false gods. And a lot of American Christians especially have the false god of money. So what we've learned thus far, having money is clearly a stewardship given by God. Use it wisely or one of two things will happen. Does anybody remember the two things that I gave you? I'm giving summaries tonight. Do you remember the two things that I gave to you that may happen if you don't use money and view money as a stewardship from God? What are the two things that can happen? Number one is God can take it away. He can blow on it. And it disappears. That's number one. What's the second thing? Amen. Somebody listen. <laughs> That's great. Yes, he can take away your ability to enjoy it. He can either take it away or he can take away your ability to enjoy it. He can give you piles of it and you can't enjoy it. And I gave you a bunch of illustrations related to that. There's an evil which I have seen under the sun. It's common among men. Common, which means this is a major problem and God has to deal with it over and over and over and over. 
a man to whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. So, a summary of the, two, of the principles that we've learned thus far. The twofold key to biblical wealth management is, who remembers the twofold key to biblical wealth management? Biblical wealth management. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a hint. The first. Okay, well, that's not the principle for management, but that's a true statement. The first principle was do you view yourself as a steward who must give an account for what is given to you? That's the first principle of biblical wealth management. Do you view yourself as a steward who must give an account for what is given to you? That will control everything you do in relation to fiscal resources and every other kind of resource too, but we're talking money. So think of yourself as a steward. You are not an owner, you are a steward. A steward manages somebody else's money. And Paul says, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful because we have to give an account. Jesus gave the parable of the unjust steward who really wasn't doing a very good job and his master said give an account and he thought man what am I going to do you know I'm, I'm blowing it here so he went around he had to ask the debtors how much they owed he didn't even know and they told him so much and he said look write out quickly and he lowered the price he lowered what they owed he said write it out quickly and give it to me and that way I can give it to the master and it'll look like I'm really doing a great job <laughs> stewardship you're not an owner you're a steward of everything that God has entrusted to you. The second principle of biblical wealth management is, are you willing to let it go when God decides to take it? Or is your heart so tied up with it that it makes you fall apart at the seams? Are you willing to let it go when God takes it? You hold it loosely. You don't hold it tightly. It's not yours. You deal with it wisely, but it's a stewardship, and the owner can take it any time he wants and pull it right out of your hand and put it someplace else. If you remember those two principles, you'll be able to deal with every resource that God entrusts to you. Okay, so we've looked at many illustrations from the Bible that told us about people who failed to have the divine perspective on money. The fakes, the charlatans, the apostates, the heretics all fall in that category. We looked at Proverbs 37 through 9 and saw that the key to those verses is contentment. We saw Paul articulates the principle of contentment. We saw dozens of passages in the New Testament. We looked at the principal passage where Paul warned Timothy about money and apostates. It's over in 1 Timothy 6, if you just, you know, I'm doing summaries right now, so if you want to write those down, you get the whole summary here. 1 Timothy 6, verses 5 through 11, where he tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. He's comparing it to the apostates, the men who are perverse, have corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. He's contrasting it there in that passage. Because we brought nothing into this world, it's certainly we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Not houses, not a bank account, not a job, food and clothing. Boy, what a different perspective than most Christians have today on money. They that will be rich fall into temptation, a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We also studied the principal passage where Peter warned about money and apostates. That was over in 2 Peter chapter 2. If you're giving your summary, here's Peter's principal passage warning about money and apostates. He talks about the false prophets, and then he talks about the false teachers who are among you. They bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then he says, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment of a long time lingereth not. Peter ties this love, this greed for money, into apostate teachers. We saw how both Paul and Peter give another reason for preaching apostasy. Who remembers the other reason? The other principal reason that they preach apostasy. Money and... Well, that's true, but what's the second one we talked about? Money and... Begins with an S and it's three letters long. 
sex. Somebody, okay, yeah. Sin also is three letters that begins with an S. Okay, okay, okay. Why do they preach it? Because it brings them money and it gives them sex. Paul warns Timothy. He says, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. That's where Paul started that passage. Then we saw that Peter gave us three illustrations that show the character of the apostates. Who remembers the three character traits of the apostates that Peter gives in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 22? The three character traits. And here we get back to what Keith just mentioned a moment ago. The angels that followed Satan in his fall, the lust for power. That was number one. The second illustration he gave was the world in the days of Noah. That's the rejection of the true God. And number three, the illustration of Sodom, which is lust for perverted sex from the divine standard, apart from the divine standard of marriage. That's your summary of 2 Peter 2, 4 through 22. Then we saw that Jude also, and let's, I'm just I'm skimming over this so that you can get it in a box and see how much of this stuff is here. Jude also write his entire epistle to show the character of the apostates, and he mentions two things. Number one, their greed, and number two, their lust for sex. Jude 1.4, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Who remember what lasciviousness is? Big, long word, but it's a very, very important word. Shameless immorality. And he says they've crept into the church. He wanted to write about the common salvation. But he said, I gotta instead warn you about these guys that are creeping into your churches. Lasciviousness. And then he goes on and talks about more of that same kind of thing in verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Folks, you better not fall into that category because he tells you where you're going to go. And there are a lot of people like that in the church. I've been here for a little over nine years. And over the nine years, talking with many different people in this church, I have heard some of the horror stories about the sexual immorality that has happened in this place. The devil doesn't attack the apostate churches. He's already got them. Where he attacks are the Bible-believing churches. That's where he tries to put his people in. And some have been in positions of leadership here. And some of it has been deliberately covered up. The people are dead now. Folks, it's no joke with God. And Jude writes his entire epistle to warn about this stuff. The covetousness and the immorality that creeps into the church and turns believers away and makes them into idolaters and God judges them. Balaam understood that principle. He couldn't curse Israel, but he taught Balak how to seduce the young men in Israel and God judged them. Dangerous stuff. It's all over the New Testament as well as the Old Testament as well. And, and that's what Jude mentions next. He says, Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. With Balaam, there was both money and sex. Balaam wanted the money, and so he told Balak to use sex to get the, uh, God to judge the Israelites, and that way Balak wouldn't have to fight him. But remember ye the words that were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. In other words, and I've just given you a humongous summary of the last four weeks, the issue of apostasy and greed and immoral sex is a huge topic in the Bible. Most people don't realize how big it is, but it goes all the way from the book of Genesis where we find Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and we find it all the way down to the book of Revelation where it talks about them, you know, refusing to give up their fornications and God has to judge them. 
It's all over the Bible. And God is giving it to us to warn us not to get involved in that kind of stuff. And that has permeated the charismatic movement and a lot of new evangelical churches. And they push it. So covetousness, that's idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. If you don't know those verses, you should write them down and you should at least memorize the references even if you don't memorize the verses. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. It's easy. Both are the fifth verses, a 3, 5, and a 5, 5. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. It tells us that covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. And remember that passage we just read in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 and following? That it's God that gives you the power to get wealth, and he takes you on that all the way down through verse 18, and you get down to verse 19, and he talks about idolatry. God's serious on that subject, folks, because anything that takes his place, that even tries to nudge him a little bit off the throne and sit on the corner of the throne, it's idolatry. And God kills idolaters among his people. The Old Testament, of course, is full of illustration. We saw that Jesus gave the illustration of that principle in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, which, as we said at that time, was included in all of the synoptic gospels. Now, <clears throat> moving to new material. Tonight, I want to talk about some of the restrictions that God gives when we might focus on one of our sins of weakness, like we might love money too much. This applies across the board, but we're going to apply it tonight to money. But restrictions that God gives when he knows we might focus on one of our sins of weakness. And we can look at one that Paul had, <clears throat> and which he admits, a weakness that he had. And we can learn the principle from that weakness and apply it across the board to money. Did you know that Paul enjoyed being the center of attention? And his weakness was that he might think too much of himself, and so God had to do something about it. In Paul's case, he calls it a thorn in the flesh. You ever heard that term? I've got a thorn in the flesh. That's something that bugs me all the time. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It comes from the Bible. Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh over in the book of Galatians. We'll look at that in just a second. I mean, 2 Corinthians. But sometimes God will give you a thorn in the flesh that is a point of suffering to refine your character to keep you from a specific sin where you have a weakness. God is going to enable you to deal with it in a way that is for your good and for his glory, even though we don't like it. At different points in our lives, each one of us will have or have had a thorn in our flesh, and we can look back and say, praise God I had that because it kept me from doing that sin that I know would have brought shame to Christ. God gave us a thorn in the flesh so we couldn't do it. You'll find yourself at some point among the barbarians, just like Paul did in our passage tonight. And you'll find yourself cold and snake bitten. But remember that God is refining you as gold tried in the fire. Job talked about that. Remember, we've done a lot of talking about Job. Job 23, 10, but I knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God allows us to go through those trials, sometimes the removal of money, or giving you money to see whether or not your heart loves the money more than you love God, or whether or not you consider yourself a steward. And when he has given you that test, that's the tr you know how they produce gold? Gold, sometimes you can find it panning for it in the rivers, like up in Alaska, and you find a chunk of gold. But most of the time, it has to be mined. You have to dig it out of the earth, and it's in rock. And the only way you can get it is you have to put the rock in a humongous pot over a blazing fire until the gold melts and runs to the bottom and because it's heaviest the gold always goes down and the rock actually floats on the surface but it takes fire to do that and that's what god does in our lives he puts us through some of those testing fires so that he can refine us so that when we are tried we can come forth as pure gold that's god's design for your life because then he can see his image, the image of Christ reflected in you after you've gone through that. So Paul understood that principle. And this is what we see, what I mentioned a moment ago. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. 
Write this one down because you will no doubt at some point have to go back and think, but Paul went through it. Paul managed to get through it. God gave him grace to get through it. By the grace of God, I can get through this one too. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And here we find out what Paul's weakness was. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Nobody else in the New Testament got as much new special revelation as the Apostle Paul did. And Paul admits it could have given me a fat head. I might have been exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. That was Paul's weakness. Your weakness may be something else. Your weakness may be liquor. Your weakness may be sex. Your weakness may be money. Your weakness may be gluttony. I mean, who knows what your weakness is? Only God knows. But God gave Paul a specific thorn in the flesh to bring him in check. You know, there are different kinds of bits. And James talks about this, uses it as an illustration that we put into horses' mouths so we can control the horses. And um, when there's a horse that is particularly obnoxious, they put in what's called a Spanish bit. It's a bit that has a little rolling wheel on it that has little prongs on the wheel so that when the horse begins to rear up they pull on it and those little rolling prongs roll across the horse's tongue and hurt it doesn't just control his head but it hurts until the horse learns I'm not going to do that again because every time I do that it hurts and James talks about how we can with a small rudder turn a great big ship we put bits in horses mouths so that we can turn them about and he says the tongue is like that too it's a little member in the body and it can produce horrendous results it can either produce great results or it's like a little fire that can burn down the whole world so learning principles tonight let me get back from james get back here to second corinthians paul had a thorn in the flesh which related to the gifts that god gave paul which related to the gifts that god gave paul so that he wouldn't get a fat head about his gifts. His weakness was he might have become proud. And you know, that would have put Paul in very, very great danger because pride is one of the principal sins. It's the sin of the devil. Isaiah chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 28. The principal sin of Satan. The five great I wills. I will be like the Most High God. Pride. Book of Proverbs. Pride goes before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. And so God gave something to Paul that was not just a thorn in the flesh, but it was actually an allowance by God for Satan to buffet Paul. Just like God allowed Satan to buffet Job, God allowed Satan to buffet Paul. He says so in the verse. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, that is to beat me up, lest I should be exalted above measure. God can give us a restriction when he knows we might focus on one of our sins of weakness. It might relate, and often does, to what God himself has given to us, just so that we don't get a fat head about it. It can relate to our gifts. It might relate to a natural talent that God has given you, such as the ability to perform music. So we've been talking about that in the morning worship. That restriction might suddenly hit you there. It might relate to your money. Because God gives us the power to get wealth, and he gives some to some, but some people, and he gives none to others. I can fall in that category about the none to others. But you know what? God has never missed a payment for any of my kids going through college and medical school, even though I never have two nickels to rub together. He gives us what we need. What is it that God has entrusted to you? As you're raising children, he's entrusted a family to you. Maybe he's entrusted you with an opportunity at work to reach somebody at your work and you're not doing it. 
with the gospel of Christ. Maybe he's entrusted you with really good health. And so now you're using it for your own pride and you're out there flexing and building muscles and looking cool and being a dude and tough. Be careful. God can put restrictions on the thing that he gives to you because all that you have that is good came from his hand. Paul understood that. Job understood that. And they responded properly. If it happens to be money, which is our topic, God can do that as well. Now, the two things of the apostates, moral impurity and greed. So we look at one of those in relation to our body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God commands you to treat it properly with moral purity and with care. And we don't have to guess what it means. There are specific areas in which the Bible lists us protecting our body temple. And most of those relate to moral purity, not merely to physical exercise. You live in either Generation X or the Millennials, depending on when you were born. Some of us predate the <laughs> Generation X, but uh, most of those in this room here relate to Generation X or Millennials. Most of them focus on the physical as evidenced by all the health clubs. We've got one right down the street here. And physical exercise is important, but it's only secondary. Now, I mentioned this this morning in the morning message. A pagan can practice biblical principles and get good results. We were comparing music and how a pagan can actually write good music that brings glory to God, whether they understood that or not, but it does. Just like a pagan can exercise and put his body in good shape and get good results. Pagans can practice biblical principles, even if they don't know their biblical principles, and they can get good results. It won't save them, but it'll give re good results of a relative nature. And I mentioned this passage this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. He doesn't say bodily exercise profits nothing. He says it profits a little because he's comparing it. He's comparing it to godliness. Bodily exercise is profitable in the temporal realm. Godliness is profitable both in the temporal realm and in the eternal spiritual realm. If you live a godly life, you're going to be avoiding certain things that hurt your body. So it is temporal profit but it also has eternal profit, living a godly life. Promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That's a comparison of the relative value of physical exercise, not a negative statement on physical exercise. It profits a little in this life. It's not something to be overlooked since you must use your body to serve Christ. You can't serve Christ without using your body. Did you know that? Even prayer, you're thinking. Even if it's silent. You have to use what God gave you here to be able to serve him in some way. Godliness profits both in this life and for eternity. Paul uses frequently the illustration of physical exercise to describe the Christian life. So he's obviously not using something evil to parallel and describe things that are spiritually good. He often does this. I loved these passages back in the days when I was a runner and a wrestler. Uh, I loved these passages because I thought, yeah, what I'm doing is good. This pleases God. And it did, because I did it for his glory, not for my glory. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and following, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. You're working towards something, folks. Paul isn't just telling him, all of you go out there and take a course uh, you know, from a, a track coach. That's not what he's telling the Corinthians. But he's telling them to run. He's paralleling the physical race with the spiritual race. And he's telling them, you're going to get a reward. Now, this is a command. This is not an option. This is not a suggestion. He's telling you to run the Christian life, not to saunter the Christian life, not to lollygag through the Christian life, not to lie down and hope somebody will push you along in a wheelbarrow in the Christian life. 
he's telling you to run. That means you have to put some energy into it. You have to do some diligent study. You have to do some diligent application. It's like that with music. I'm going to tell you something that I wasn't going to tell you until next week. More than one-third of the Bible is music. Did you know that? And most Christians don't know squat about music. It doesn't have musical notations in it, but it's music, and I'll prove that to you when we get to the passages over and over and over and over again. You know, one-third of the Bible is prophecy. We all understand that prophecy is an important thing to study. But more than one-third is music. And we want everything fed to us on a, a silver spoon instead of doing what we're supposed to do, being diligent, running a race, studying the Word of God, nailing it down, understanding it, we want somebody just to sort of feed it to us. We go for pablum every Sunday instead of wanting to work on this. I'm giving you keys so that you can unlock things for yourself. You and I don't have enough time for me to teach you everything that you need in your life, but I can give you keys so that you can find it as you study the Word of God yourself. And God has given you His Holy Spirit to open up passages of Scripture that you need so that you can understand it. Dear people, I love you. This is why I do this. I'm not here because it's making me rich and powerful and famous. I can tell you that. I'm here because God called me here and he put a love in my heart for you. And I'm, by the grace of God, going to do this as long as he wants me here. I don't know how long that'll be. But I'm trying to follow him and teach you what I can because the days are coming when there will be starvation in the land, starvation for the word of God. It's happened throughout the history of God's people. Okay, back to preaching. Get off the meddling. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. That's a command. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That's self-control. And every one of you, that's one of the every believer gifts. The gift of self-control. Not all of us exercise it. Not all of us use it. A lot of us let things go flying off the handle. But if you want to win, if you want the mastery, you're temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's the pagan world. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That's your obligation. You don't follow the lusts of the flesh. You keep under your body. You bring it into subjection. You go through the discipline of the training. You don't waste time. You're not wasting time. You're wasting your life. You can't waste time. Time goes on. You're merely wasting your life. From the time that I started this sermon until now, your life got shorter. There's coming a day when you're going to die or the rapture will take place. Hope you've been absorbing something that will change your life. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Sort of like you have those plastic water bottles. You drink all the water, and then what do you do? Do you hang on to it and refill it, and then hang on to it and refill it? And hang? No, you don't. You throw it away, don't you? Paul says, I don't want to be a castaway. Of course, there are multiple passages in the New Testament that teach that principle of the body, temple, and our responsibility for keeping it morally pure and spiritually pure. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you're the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Remember, we're tying things together. Morning worship, service, 
We've been talking about music as one of the principal keys of worship. And in the Old Testament, where do we see the principal center of worship? The temple. And God has moved his temple. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the apostles were all there for the day of Pentecost. It was one of the feasts where every Jewish male, three feasts in the year, where every Jewish male was supposed to show up in Jerusalem at the temple. And God did something that day. He changed temples. The Shekinah glory of God had rested on the temple of Solomon, and it was so bright and powerful that it drove the priests out from ministering in the temple. And it departed in the days of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel saw the Shekinah glory leave the temple and go across the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives and stand on the Mount of Olives, and then he saw it disappear off into the wilderness. And on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire showed up a fire that burned but did not consume, just like at the burning bush in Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. And it rested on something very flammable upon the hair of the apostles on their heads. They spoke with other languages. Eighteen specific languages are mentioned in Acts chapter 2. They were not babbling. And God set up a new temple. And that's why Paul says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. We can't see the Shekinah glory here tonight, but it's present. Because the Spirit of God rests inside every one of you who knows Christ. Are you defiling the temple of God? For whoever defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. Have you brought another idol into the temple of God? We happen to be talking about money. That's one of the idols that gets brought in. To those temples where God says, I alone have the right to dwell there. There's going to be a third temple in the history of Israel. It's going to be built by the Antichrist, and the Antichrist... At the three and a half year mark through the tribulation period is going to set up an image of himself in the temple and say everybody's got to worship it. Jesus warns about this in Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. Daniel warns about it in the Old Testament. Book of Revelation describes it in detail. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians. We're almost there to the book of Revelation. I won't preach all those messages yet. But your body's a temple. Don't set up a false god. The apostates do. Money and sex. And the desire for power. And for control. Paul talks about the immorality issue in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And then he ties it to the temple. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God doesn't just own your spirit. He owns your body. And he's made your body a temple. And the Holy Spirit of God dwells inside your body. And that's why you must keep it pure. Dear people, Second Corinthians. So we saw First Corinthians three, First Corinthians six. We find it again in Second Corinthians chapter six, verses fourteen and following. That's why he says that you are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he believed with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, you, we usually just apply this to marriage, but that applies to everything. Being not equal, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's one of the warnings in Scripture, too, about joint ventures. It's one of the warnings about partnerships. You better be careful. Have you got 
everything you own tied up with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That applies across the board. Because, as he points out once again, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Money can be an idol. That's the whole point that we've been proving through this series here. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, the idol. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We find it again over in Ephesians chapter 2, if you're taking notes. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now we're putting together a building here. The chief cornerstone is Jesus. We've got a foundation laid for the building. You always lay the foundation first before you build the building. You don't build all the superstructure and then think, oh, I forgot to lay the foundation. So you go and dig underneath your building and try to pour a foundation. It doesn't work. The foundation has been laid. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation, that is a place to live, a habitation of God through the Spirit. This is a big theme in the New Testament. Okay. Well, we didn't get quite as far as I hoped tonight, but you've gotten your good overview. We're going to stop there. It's a quarter after. There are two more things that we have to talk about in relation to miracles and money, and we want to talk about specifically the positive things and those we'll save for next week our gracious heavenly father once again we thank you for your word and for its power please keep us from idolatry help us to understand your purposes for money and why you sometimes give it and why you sometimes withhold it and why sometimes you give us a thorn in the flesh in relation to gifts that you have given to us because as you do that you keep us from sin and we can thank you for it. What you do, you do well. You do all things well, and you love us, and you never do anything in our lives that's not for our good and for your glory. But you also hold us accountable, and you've given us a command to run the race, to run it with boldness, to run it with diligence, to run it with consistency, to run it with moral purity, to run it in a way that brings glory to you. Because in the end, when we receive our crowns, we suddenly realize you're the one that did it because you're the one that helped us run the race and we take our crowns and we cast them at the feet of the true victor the Lord Jesus Christ how sad it will be if we have nothing to cast at his feet to show our thanksgiving and our praise our worship and our honor keep us from idols and as John has told his little children, keep yourselves from idols. We have a responsibility to obey. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.